Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Franklin. I'm the co-founder of NordCal SCI, which stands for Northern California Small Aquatic Injury Foundation. Welcome to today's presentation on electrical stimulation and the various options after a spinal cord injury for you to consider. Um, this program is uh, presented as part of our Virtual is a New Reality series, which is made possible through a generous grant from the Reeve Foundation. Um, we have a great presentation today by uh, a great friend of NorCal CI and a very experienced physical therapist, Jennifer Kapitanek. But before uh, she gets started, let me do a couple of housekeeping items. So all of you have been muted and that way we could eliminate any background noise during the course of the presentation. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to Jennifer, we have a Q&A session. So the presentation is gonna be about 40 minutes or so long and we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end dedicated for a Q&A. So the way that you could uh, get your questions answered is uh, either by using the chat feature on your screen and you can uh, send those questions throughout the presentation and I'll ask them uh, from Jennifer at the end. Or if you wish to send me an email during the course of the presentation, you may do so. The email address is info at norcalsci.org. The second thing that I'm gonna share with you is that we are recording this session and we'll make it available to anyone that registered for the event uh, via an email that they're gonna receive on Monday. So if you need to step away or jump off the call for some reason, don't worry, uh, you're not gonna miss a thing. Uh, we'll make sure that you get the recorded version uh, on Monday. Uh, those were basically a couple of items that I want to share with you. So let's move forward and let me introduce to you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, she received her doctorate in physical therapy from Chapman University in 2008 and has 12 years of experience as a physical therapist. For the last five years, she has been part of the therapy team at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Spinal Cord Injury Rehab uh, Department, one of the top rehab hospitals for spinal cord injury in the U.S. Uh, Jennifer received her advanced certifications in exoskeleton and functional electrical stimulation use with hundreds of hours of clinical application across spinal cord and other neurological injuries. Her clinical skills have been developed uh, across many areas of PT, including acute care, cardiac rehabilitation, orthopedics, and most recently, spinal cord injury rehabilitation. So without further ado, uh, I am pleased to introduce Jennifer. Thank you, Franklin, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'm really excited to give you the second talk in this series. Like Franklin said, if you have questions, please put them in the chat um, so we can get to them at the end of the session. I'm gonna give you a lot of information and I don't wanna overwhelm you, but if something really spikes your interest and you have further questions on it, please feel free to continue to ask them. I am going to stop my video and share my screen so you guys can hear me, but you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Here we go. So this morning, I am going to talk to you about the different types of electric stimu electrical stimulation. In the last session that I spoke about, I kind of introduced what electrical stimulation was. Today, I really wanna focus on, there's three types of electrical stimulation that you'll kind of see on the market. So I want to explain the difference to you between those devices, talk about the availability and coverage of those devices, and then really important, talk about the different electrodes and what you would need to kind of use those devices safely at home. So in terms of what types of electrical stimulation are available on the market, there's three different kind of types that you'll see generally. Um, they use the same basic concepts in terms of sending electrical impulse to, this, uh, to the muscle or to the nerve, but they kind of target different things. So we're gonna talk about transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. You'll see it abbreviated as TENS. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation. You'll see it abbreviated as NMES and functional electrical stimulation, which is FES. So what is TENS? TENS, transcutaneous electrical stimulation, is a sensory, a superficial electrical impulse that's sent through the skin. And its main goal is to target the sensory nerve. 
So if you're getting a TENS device, you're not looking at getting a muscle or motor contraction in a muscle. You're actually just looking more at activating the sensory nerve to help with pain and hypersensitivity. So the goal here is not to contract a muscle and see that muscle tighten underneath the electrodes. It's more to send a smaller wave through to the sensory nerve to decrease pain and hypersensitivity. So there's two theories on how this works in terms of why does TENS decrease pain. The electrical current can stimulate the nerves that block the transmission of kind of that pain signal to the brain. So normally your brain tells you, oh, that hurts, and then you feel it. But using TENS can help to kind of turn off those nerves so that pathway isn't experienced by your brain. So your body may still technically be feeling the pain, but because your brain can't perceive it, you don't feel it. The other um, theory that's kind of out there on why TENS helps to work with pain and hypersensitivity is that nerve stimulation, especially to the sensory nerve, helps to increase the level of endorphins. And endorphins are the body's natural pain-killing chemical. So those are the two theories kind of how TENS can help with decreasing pain and hypersensitivity. There's plenty of research out there that shows that TENS can positively affect both musculoskeletal and neurogenic pain. And there's research that shows that it can also kind of help with acute and chronic pain. So what are the availability of TENS units? This is a lot of people's questions, right? I mean, a lot of stuff costs a lot of money and we want to see, you know, what's available out there on the market. So TENS units, they do not require a physician's referral and they can be purchased online or at any medical supply store. Usually they're pretty inexpensive in terms of talking about electrical stimulation devices. They are usually the cheapest of the options in terms of electrical stimulation. The price of the unit though can really change based on what functions the device has. And that's what I'm gonna kind of talk to you about on what to look for and maybe what to pass on in terms of what's the most important on a TENS unit. Um, so the cheapest option might not provide the best outcome, but the most expensive option, it also might not provide the best outcome. So it's really understanding what you want on the device, what you're using it for and what to look for. In terms of insurance covering TENS, I'm gonna be really honest with you. It, they very rarely cover these sort of units. If you are trying to get a unit like this covered by insurance, you have to have a physician's referral. So they have to write like an order that they would for any medication or anything else that they're ordering for you. And each company, each insurance company has kind of their own policy and guidelines. Um, I can tell you right off the bat, Medicare and Medi-Cal, do not cover TENS units. Some of the private insurances, you may get some coverage, but it's usually a long lengthy process that is quite a headache for a lot of people. So they choose to just private pay and purchase their own unit versus going through the headache of insurance. But if it's something that you can do and you have the energy and time for, then it's absolutely a possibility with some of the more private insurance companies. Um, research is continuing to be published about the effectiveness of TENS and we're hoping that, you know, that will change insurance companies to kind of start to cover these types of devices. But as of right now, they're not there where they think that this is something that could replace, you know, paying for your monthly medication or something like that in terms of improving um, pain outcomes. So what to look for when buying a TENS unit? It can get super confusing out there. And I'm gonna kind of go through the different components of ten un TENS units and tell you kind of what to keep an eye on and maybe what to pass up. So in terms of channels, most units comes with either one or two channels. So what that means is you can stimulate one or two areas of the body at the same time. So in terms of pain management, the more channels that you have, honestly, the better. So you can you know, apply four electrodes if you have two channels, whereas you can only apply two electrodes if you have one channel. So I do recommend a device that has a two channel option. 
Um, something that TENS units have built into them that are actually really good are pre-programmed therapies. So the next slide, I'm going to kind of talk about different specifics um, and kind of different aspects of TENS units that you can look at. But these pre-programmed therapies, they already kind of program everything in for you. So they're easy to use and really it requires minimal understanding of kind of the science and what the unit works, um, what the unit needs to do. So if you look for a device that has these different pre-programmed therapies in, it can make it easier for you if your main goal is pain management and decreasing hypersensitivity. If you wanna get a little more into, you know, changing and manipulating what the TENS unit can do, these are some of the aspects that you wanna look for. And if you're looking for a unit online, if you open up like the about this unit on Amazon or something like that, all of this should come up. And it may look like a lot of information, but I kind of want to break it down for you so you have a general idea of what everything means. So the frequency is the pulse rate. It's kind of how fast the pulse is coming out of the device through the electrode, into, through your skin, into that sensory nerve. And so if a device offers a higher frequency, it's generally more comfortable. So what you wanna look for on a device is that you know, a frequency goes up to 100 or 120 Hertz, which is what it's measured in. Some of the cheaper devices only go up to like 40 or 50, and they may not be as comfortable and allow you to use the device the way that you want to. So that's something that you can look for if you're really looking at different kind of parts of the TENS unit. The pulse width is the depth of the pulse. And what that means is it's how far that electric current is being kind of sent into your body. So if there's a lower pulse width, it tends to be more comfortable because we're not shoving that electrical stimulation so deep into your body. And with TENS, you're looking just for a sensory stimulation to that sensory nerve. And those sensory nerves tend to float more superficially or more at the top of your body. So you don't need a big pulse width to get to them. The pulse width comes in more handy when you're looking at motor responses, which is what we'll talk about when we get to the NMES device. Um, so a lower pulse width leads to more comfort during the treatment, but a higher pulse width may give you more stimulation and more relief if you can tolerate it. So pulse widths usually are anywhere from zero to like 250 to 300. So that's what you can kind of look for in terms of pulse width. The amplitude is the intensity. It's how much power you can kind of give to that nerve to stimulate it. A lower amplitude is obviously more comfortable, but a higher amplitude is gonna be a greater stimulation and provide you more relief. So when looking at amplitudes, they're measured in milliamps and you kind of want to think about something that goes up into the 80s or 100s, if you can find something like that. Um, amplitude with a milliamp of like 10 or 20 really isn't going to provide you the oomph and the power that you need to get any sort of contraction. Then the last one that you can, can look for is the mode. And there's a bunch of different modes that are usually built into TENS units. So constant would be that it's just providing that electrical impulse to the nerve constantly. It doesn't turn off, it's going the whole time. A burst would provide a quick impulse and then let it relax and then provide a quick impulse and let it relax, relax again. So you can get kind of some relief between. And then modulation follows like a cyclical pattern. So the electrical impulse delivery is not constant and there's different settings kind of built in that can allow for maybe higher contractions at some times and lower at other. So that's kind of what you can look for in terms of TENS. Again, the pre-programmed therapies have all of these frequencies, pulse width, amplitude, and mode kind of built already into them. So if what I just said is totally overwhelming, I recommend looking for a unit that has these pre-programmed therapies and it really makes the use of a TENS unit a lot easier. The next unit that we wanna talk about is the NMES, which is neuromuscular electrical stimulation. So these devices, if you find something like this, 
This is gonna deliver a deeper electrical impulse through the skin. And the main goal here is to target a motor nerve. So the goal of this type of electrical stimulation is to actually cause a muscle contraction. We're not looking at pain and sensory levels with something like this. We're looking at actually exciting the motor nerve and causing that muscle to contract. So and the goals of NMES are very different than what your goals of your TENS unit would be. So for NMES, we're looking at improving local blood circulation, improving or maintaining muscle, muscle length and flexibility, maintaining muscle size and strength, or re-educating a muscle that is kind of contracting but not contracting and strong to its full ability. So can we use this sort of stimulation to improve that? So in terms of NMES, generally it contracts one to two muscle groups at a time while the body is at rest. So availability of NMES, unfortunately it kind of follows the exact thing that I talked about in terms of TENS is that they don't require a physician's referral if you wanna buy it online. So it can be purchased online. It can be purchased at a medical supply store. The price ranges are a little bit higher here because you're looking at more intensity from the unit. So the price range here is usually anywhere from $50 to $400. Again, the price that you're paying doesn't necessarily tell you the $400 device is the best device. So I'm gonna again go through different aspects of the device you may wanna look for and kind of look to see if those are on the device versus just buying the most expensive device there. In terms of insurance coverage, again, just like with TENS, most medical insurances do not cover NMES units. If they are covered, it has to be considered medically necessary. And so the doctor can write a referral that says, you know, NMES is medically necessary for this individual after spinal cord injury, which if you ask me or if you ask the doctor, we agree that it is a medically necessary device because it really can help with you know, pain and it can help with re-education of the muscle and skin, uh, decreasing skin breakdown and stuff like that. Insurance just doesn't see it that way yet, unfortunately. So again, Medicare, Medi-Cal, they will 100% deny these devices. Some um, private insurances will cover. You can look it up in your policy. You can call your insurance company and see what they have to say, but each policy has their own guidelines. And I was looking and I was gonna put a bunch of, you know, information up here for you guys on insurance companies, and it was gonna be so overwhelming that I decided against it because each company kind of has their own policy on coverage. The one thing that I do want to let you know is that you will find dual devices, meaning you will find some devices that are um, advertised as TENS and NMES units in one, and those do exist, and they're actually a good device to look at if you're looking to get both kind of pain um, management, hypersensitivity management, but you also want to tap into more of the motor component, the muscle component of a unit. So you will see online, especially on Amazon, if you start searching this stuff, a TENS slash NMES unit, and it's a very appropriate device and it follows kind of these same exact guidelines that I'm talking to you about, about the two devices. So if you're interested in both, that would be a great option. In terms of what to look for when buying an NMES unit, a lot of what the kind of descriptions of the um, aspects of the device are the same. But when you're looking from a motor component, from a neuromuscular electrical stimulation component, the numbers that we're looking for are maybe a little bit different. So in terms of the numbers of the channels, again, it's usually one or two channels. If you have two channels, you can stimulate multiple muscles at a time. So in terms of, you know, trying to strengthen an upper arm or a shoulder, something like that, if you can stimulate the bicep and the tricep at the same time or alternating, by having two channels and you can get more bang for your buck versus just slapping electrodes on the bicep and getting a bicep contraction. So two channels is definitely what I would recommend in terms of when you're looking for a device. Frequency again is the number of electrical impulses per second, just like we talked about with the tens. With the tens, we talked about that the lower the frequency, 
leads to um, kind of more of a contraction. So with motor, with a motor component, we're looking at it this way. If I have a low frequency, so if I have like five hertz coming through, I'm going to get a good contraction, but it's going to be really, really uncomfortable because the frequency is so low that I'm going to feel each and every one of those pulses to the nerve. So a higher frequency is actually more comfortable. So when you're looking at motor stimulation, you do actually want a device that the frequency goes up pretty high. So in terms of thinking about frequency levels for something like this in terms of motor contraction, you know, if you can find something again that goes up into the 50s, 80s, 100s, you may feel more comfortable with the device and you may be able to tolerate better for getting a better muscle contraction. In terms of pulse width, again, that's where, that's how deep the contraction goes into your muscle. With NMES, we are looking for a motor contraction and those motor nerves, they live a little bit deeper in the muscle than the sensory nerves do. So when we're looking to get a muscle contraction from using electrical stimulation, we really want something that has a bigger pulse width. That means it's gonna send that kind of electrical stimulation impulse deeper into the muscle and we will get a contraction. So when you're looking at pulse width, you want something that has a bigger pulse width if, if possible. In terms of numbers that you're kind of looking for, for pulse width, you know, if you can get up in the 100s, 200s, some of them even go higher than 200s, you're looking at getting a better contraction with the device. The other component that you wanna look at is modes. Just like on the TENS unit, NMES does come usually with modes. They're a little bit different than the TENS unit. You have a constant mode usually on an NMES, which is then going to deliver just a constant electrical impulse to the nerve and cause a constant muscle contraction. It generally sends it through both channels. So if you have one channel on your bicep and one channel on your tricep and it's on constant, it's gonna send it to both of those muscles at the same time. So they're both gonna contract at the same time. Um, there's a synchronous channel and also an alternating. So these two channels can allow for you to turn the modes or turn the stimulation on and off to prevent fatigue. So instead of just having that bicep contracting for five minutes at a time, it can send an impulse and let the muscle contract and then not send the impulse and let the muscle relax. So it can allow for kind of relaxation of the muscle between impulses, which won't fatigue it out as quickly. So those are, that's a good mode to kind of look for. And then alternating is when, if you have a two channel system, you can stimulate one channel and then that channel goes off and then the other channel stimulates. So you're not stimulating both of the muscles at the same time, you're alternating between the bicep being stimulated and then the tricep being stimulated. So other things to look for kind of when looking at an NMES unit, again, I have like pictures on each of these slides of some of the different devices. And in other sessions, I'll go more into it in terms of, you know, what devices are really out there and what's the best, but these are just some of the basic devices that you'll come in contact with if you're looking on Amazon or at medical supply stores. Um, the other components that you may see when looking for an NMES unit are amplitude, the ramp time, the on-off cycles, and the duration of the treatment session. So really quickly, the amplitude is how much power or how much electrical impulse is being delivered to that nerve. So the more amplitude that the machine offers, generally the increased contraction that you're going to get. So you want, if you're looking for a motor contraction, you really want something that has a high amplitude so you can send a lot of power to that nerve and get a muscle contraction. On the flip side of that though, if the amplitude is super high, it may be uncomfortable for you. So if you're stimulating an area that you can feel, you may not be able to tolerate that high intensity. 
But if you're stimulating an area you can't feel, that high amplitude is really going to allow for a better outcome in terms of a muscle contraction. Um, one of the other pieces that you really want to look for if you can feel the areas that you're using this device is a ramp up, ramp down option. So say I have my amplitude set at 40 or 50, which is a pretty good amount of stimulation to the muscle. If it goes from zero to 40 instantly and I can feel it, it's not gonna feel very good. But some devices have the ability to kind of slowly move from that zero to 40 and then slowly move from that 40 to zero when it goes off, which can improve kind of the comfort of the contraction for you if you're stimulating somewhere that you can feel. Again, if you're stimulate, stimulating an area that you don't have sensation, this isn't as important. But for some of you know, um, you individuals who are incomplete, sensory or motor wise, this is something that I would really look for in terms of looking for options on an NMES unit. Again, one of the other um, options that's really important is the on and off cycle. So this is kind of the work to rest ratio. If you're looking to strengthen a muscle, you don't want it to be constantly contracted for four or five minutes at a time because it's going to fatigue very quickly. You want it to be able to kind of cycle on and off. So you want to be able to provide that stimulation to the muscle, and then you want that stimulation to come off to let the muscle re relax. So most devices have on and off cycles that you can set for like a 10 second contraction and then a 10 second rest, or you can manipulate those numbers for whatever works best for you. And then most devices also have just different durations of treatment sessions. And usually you can go anywhere from zero to up to 60 minutes in terms of using these um, programs at home. So those are the functions of an NMES. Again, very similar to a TENS unit, but a little bit different in terms of what you really wanna look for because for NMES, you're really looking for motor contractions and a muscle contraction, not just that sensory stimulation like we're looking for in a TENS unit. So what is FES? FES is functional electrical stimulation. And just like we talked about before with the NMES, it delivers a deeper electrical impulse through the skin to target the motor nerve. The difference with FES is that generally we're targeting multiple muscles while an individual is performing a functional movement or exercise. So FES uses the same exact ideas and technology that NMES does but it's a much stronger contraction. And instead of just contracting one or two muscles, you're contracting six to 12 muscles so that the body can be performing a functional activity. So FES units, 100% of them do require a physician's referral and a letter of medical necessity. So these are not devices that you can just go on Amazon and purchase. If something is advertised as an FES unit online, it's more than likely an NMES unit and they're just categorizing it the wrong way. A true functional electrical stimulation unit is sold by individual companies and is only um, available to a person through a physician refer referral and a letter of medical, ne uh, medical necessity. So the letter, letter of medical necessity is usually written by a physical therapist. It's usually after you've trialed some of these devices and the therapist decides that it is an appropriate device for you. Um, these devices have a very wide price range. They are used to only be, up until like eight to 10 years ago, there was really only like one or two companies who were providing FES units in the past like eight to 10 years though, a lot of companies have jumped on board. This has really become something um, big and strong, especially in the spinal cord injury um, field. So you will see a lot more now. Um, insurance sometimes covers FES units. It's a very long process. I can tell you that I've gone through with many of my patients the process. I have written hundreds of letters of medical necessity and I have re rewritten them so that it can be covered by insurance. Um, insurance usually 100% denies it, denies the coverage the first time around. 
but a lot of the companies that um, generate these devices have people on staff who will work with you to continue to fight with insurance companies and kind of resubmit a second or third time. I would say on average, if you're looking to get an FES unit covered through insurance, you're looking at a six to 18 month process. And I know that sounds miserable, but that's usually what it is in terms of kind of the back and forth with the insurance company to prove that this really is something that's medically necessary. Um, usually the companies will really work with you and to kind of work through that process. And usually the client or patient doesn't have to do a ton of the work of the company will. There is also the option though, if you don't wanna wait that time, a lot of the companies do allow for private pay and cash pay to get the devices to you a lot sooner. So that is also an option that most of the companies will talk to you about. In terms of what to look for when buying an FES device, again, you're looking for numbers of channels. Usually there's six to 12 channels available here. And the more channels that you have, the more muscles you're stimulating during your functional task. So the functional tasks available on the market right now are arm cycling, leg cycling. One company makes like a seated elliptical device where you can do arms and legs at the same time. And one company does make a standing and gait device, but that is for use only in the clinic right now. The first three though, the arm, leg, and elliptical, are all um, approved for home use. So those are devices that you can get in the home. Other things that you want to think about when you're looking at purchasing an FES device or going through something like this is the footprint of the unit. They are big, they do take up space. You can see in the picture here that they aren't, you know, these small little compact square units like the TENS and the NMES devices. You have to have space for them. Um, another thing that you want to look at when you're buying an FES device is the clinical and technical support available that kind of comes with the device. If you get the device early on in your injury and your body starts to change, you're going to want the ability to adapt your program on this device as your body changes. And so a lot of the devices out on the market come with lifetime clinical and technical support that's available to kind of help you use the device as best as possible through your recovery. Even after a chronic injury, you know, if you've been injured for 10, 20 years and you're looking at something like this, by starting to use this device, it may change your body. So again, it may need to be adapted and that clinical and technical support becomes really important. The other thing you wanna think about is the ease of setup and use. Most of these devices you can do directly from a wheelchair. Some of the companies you have to transfer onto a seat. So the assistance needed for setup and takedown is something to take into consideration when you're looking at buying an FES device. So very quickly, I just wanna go through electrodes because this is a really important component of all three of these devices. Any electrical stimulation device that you're using, you are going to be using electrodes and believe it or not, the electrodes are really important in determining how well you're gonna get what you're looking for from the device. So they allow that electrical impulse to travel through the skin and they target that nerve, whether it's the motor nerve or the sensory nerve, depending on the device that you're using. Um, most devices come with electrodes, but it might be necessary to purchase additional electrodes or the ones that they send with the device aren't the best options for what you're looking for and how you're looking to use the device. So two electrodes are used for each channel of the, of the electrical stimulation device and the electrical impulse flows between the two electrodes. So I think we talked about this in the last um, session that I gave, but those electrodes need to be placed at least two finger widths apart. If they're too close together, they could cause burning of the skin because that electrical impulse doesn't have enough area to, uh, to kind of travel between one to the other. They should not be placed directly over a joint and they should be placed on skin that's clean and dry. We also talked about last in the last session how the skin needs to be intact. So you can't place them directly over a wound. It needs to be healthy, intact skin that you're placing the electrodes on. So the same electrodes can be used over multiple sessions. You want to look at replacing your electrodes when they're no longer sticking the more hair you have on your body, 
the drier your skin is, those are all gonna kind of make the electrodes stick for a shorter amount of time, so require you to replace them sooner. If the electrodes become discolored, usually they come as like a white or a light blue color. If you start to see that they're becoming yellow or brown, it's time to get rid of them. Or if there's any visible damage to the electrode, you wanna make sure that you're replacing it. It's not safe to use an electrode that isn't in a healthy condition because it can cause shocking or burning to the skin. So you definitely want to make sure that you're using safe electrodes when you're using any of these electrical stimulation devices. So one thing to just be aware of when you're buying your electrical stimulation device is there's two types of connections that you normally see on electrodes. There's the snap connections and the pigtail connections. Usually the snap connections are seen more on TENS units, so for the sensory stimulation, and generally the pigtail connections are seen more on the NMES and the FES units. So if you're purchasing more electrodes for your device, just make sure that you are looking at the connection and making sure that you aren't purchasing the wrong one. How to choose the appropriate electrode size and shape. So it's really important that the electrode that you're putting on your body matches the area of the body that you're putting it on. So larger muscle would require a larger electrode, vice versa, smaller muscle would require a smaller electrode. You also wanna think about the shape of the muscle. So if you think about the glute muscle, the muscle on your rear end, it's a big round muscle. Right. Whereas if you think about the tricep on the back of your arm, it's a skinny, narrow muscle. So in terms of looking at electrode sizes and shapes, you would really want to try to match the, the shape of the muscle to the shape of the electrode. That's going to allow for a better contraction. So again, a lot of times when you buy these units, they send out just, you know, random electrodes to you and this may be something that you want to switch up so that you can get a better um, effect from your device. So larger electrodes are usually used for larger muscles in the body. The one thing that you also want to think about is the larger the electrode, it's going to distribute the electrical impulse over your skin and muscle in a bigger area. So a lot of times it allows for a greater intensity of stimulation because you're not just sending it through a tiny two by two square on your leg, you're sending it through a big rectangular five by three area, which is going to kind of generate that impulse across a bigger area on your muscle. The one thing you wanna think of though, is that if you start to put big electrodes on smaller muscles, it may cause bleeding. So what that means is if I put a big electrode on my bicep, and my biceps are not big by any means, if I slap that big electrode on my bicep, because it's so big, it may actually start sending the impulses to the other muscles around my bicep, and I might be getting contractions of muscles that I'm not looking for. So if I'm looking to work on bending my elbow to bring my hand to my mouth for a feeding activity or something like that, and I have a huge electrode on my bicep, well, my tricep might start to contract too, and I won't get the effect that I'm looking for. So again, match the electrode to the size of the muscle that you're stimulating. Same thing if you're using TENS. You know, if you're looking at eliminating pain in the neck area and you're using huge electrodes, you may be stimulating other areas of the body. Smaller electrodes are obviously gonna be used for smaller muscles in the body. It eliminates that bleeding of what I was talking about in terms of, you know, if you're just trying to contract the bicep and you're getting it, the tricep contracting also, decreasing the electrode size can limit that. Uh, and smaller surface area of the electrode will decrease the distribution of the stimulation. So it's not going to travel, that stimulation is not going to travel as far um, if the electrode size is small. So here's just a few pictures of electrode placements. In the further sessions, we're going to talk about different um, uses and areas of the body. So we'll go into kind of more of these electrode placements in depth. But again, you can just kind of see the different shapes and sizes, right? We have the smaller electrodes on the calf. We have the bigger electrodes on the back of the thigh. 
And then we have this really small electrodes on the forearm. So the size of the electrode matches the size and the shape of the muscle. In terms of purchasing electrodes, electrodes are never covered by insurance. Even if you get a device covered by insurance, they will not continue to cover future electrode purchases. The only insurance that I've ever seen do that is workers' comp. Um, but if you don't have workers' comp, you're gonna be purchasing your own. And getting them online, honestly, is the cheapest option. A lot of the vendors who provide the devices can sell them directly to you. But if you go on Amazon, you can buy electrodes in bulk, and that would be my recommendation. Again, just make sure that you're buying the right connection, whether it's the snap or the pigtail. So these are just a few of the options that are available on Amazon. But if you put in, you know, neuromuscular electrical stimulation electrode, a ton of options will come up. So that is kind of your introduction to the three different areas of electrical stimulation. Um, in each of the next three sessions, three, four, and five, I really want to dive into the specifics of TENS, the specifics of NMES, and the specifics of FES, and really show you how you can use these in different areas of your body. Um, so that will be kind of the next three sessions, and then the last session will be kind of the research on the indwelling stimulation that's kind of out there in kind of more of the research areas right now. That's it. That's what I got. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. And if you could go ahead and unshare your screen, we have a bunch of questions as expected. Sure. Okay, the first question um, is specific to a unit and a unit called ENSO unit. And the gentleman is having uh, struggles with the best way to use it. Uh, do you have, are you familiar with that particular unit? I'm not 100% familiar with unit. Um, I think it's more of a TENS unit than it is a neuromuscular stimulation unit. And I may be wrong. And if they want to chat really fast back with that, they can let me know what they're actually using it for. Um, but it, again, it would be, I would need to know more of, you know, what the issue was using the unit and things like that. Um, if you know if it's a TENS unit or an NMES unit, based on kind of the information that I gave in this presentation and kind of manipulating the different settings and stuff, you can see if it would help. Um, but it's something that I can um, also look into and give you more feedback if you need it. Okay, great. Um, similar question. Um, again, not sure if you're familiar with this device. A Swiss stimulation, Swiss stim is called. Um, any familiar, familiar familiarity with that? So Swiss Stim, I do believe is more for TENS and um, more for pain management than it is gonna be for motor control. So you're gonna be looking at that more as a TENS unit than you are gonna be a neuromuscular electrical stimulation unit. I'm writing these all down because in the next sessions, um, I'm I can kind of introduce more of these devices that you guys are asking about and maybe problem solve through them a little bit more with you. Um, but again, it's really hard to give the exact details on it right now. How many of these types of units are out there on the marketplace? Yeah. So in terms of TENS and NMES units, if you do a, you know, Amazon search, you can come up with a, over a hundred different options and different kind of companies that produce these devices. Again, so the FES units, there's a lot fewer. The FES, I would say in terms of FDA approval, there's probably eight different um, brands, so to say, on the market. But when you're looking at TENS and NMES units, every medical device company creates their own because they're easy devices to create. They all tend to work pretty much in the same fashion. They all do have very different price tags though. So in terms of using a very specific device, I may not know the name of the device, but it works in the general pattern that kind of I described during this presentation. So if uh, anyone were to do a search like that, how mm -hmm. would you advise them to kind of, to get through all this dozens yeah. and dozens of options? What's the best way of so filtering? So I think definitely figuring out first what you're looking for in terms of the unit. If you're looking just for pain management, you're going to definitely focus towards TENS. If you're looking towards motor contraction, you're going to look more towards NMES units. And what I would highly recommend is 
if you are seeing a therapist right now or you see a doctor, talk to them about them also. But you know, you can get overwhelmed very quickly online in terms of different devices. Um, MPEP EMPI was one of the first creators kind of of these devices. And if you look at the device, it looks old and it kind of looks like outdated, but they're, they make one of the best, honestly, TENS and NMES devices on the market, I think, because they've been in the business for so long. A lot of companies are coming out with very new flashy devices. And again, while flashy looks really good to the eye, it really probably does the same exact thing as my favorite MP unit that I've been using for 12 or 15 years. So, you know, I can't point you in the exact direction, but again, looking for the different functionalities of the devices is what I would say and kind of compare, contrast and compare what you're getting and the price range and see what would work best. Speaking of MP, one of our uh, attendees, uh, sent a chat saying that she thought MP was out of business. Do you know anything about that? So MP did go out of business. Somebody else is creating, is creating their devices now. And I don't remember off the top of my head what the company is called. So now it's the same exact device, but two years ago they switched the name and it's totally not in my head right now, but I will make myself a note to look it up and let you know because they they are creating the same exact device it's under a different title now okay and by the way uh, everyone all the visuals that jennifer showed you they're purely for uh, sort of of the devices they're purely for the presentation and visual purposes she's not endorsing any one of them uh, that that you see and so we have no uh, data or information to share with you about any of these devices that, that you could benefit from. Um, okay, um, next question is use of trigger when walking. Um, yeah, so that, so triggers usually are used for more functional electrical stimulation devices. Every once in a while you'll find a trigger on an NMES device. So what that means is the device comes kind of with a button that if you are performing a functional task, you can actively contract and send that stimulation to the muscle at a certain time that you want to. So a lot of times this is used for foot drop when people don't have the musculature to actually bring their toes up when they're stepping. And if you were to put stimulation pads on the tibialis anterior, which is the front of the shin muscle, if you had the kind of program set up and you have a trigger, you can trigger, you can push that button to actually contract those muscles to actually bring the toes up and clear the foot during a walking or a gait pattern. So it's more, it's a more advanced NMES device. Not all NMES devices come with a trigger. So if that's something that you're looking for, that you would have to definitely search for that. Um, but it is something that's used um, a lot in the stroke population actually, in terms of clearing the foot, preventing the foot drop and preventing falls with ambulation. There's not a lot of research that shows that using it is necessarily going to eventually wean you off of it, but it is something that some people use. Okay, um, next question. Can NMES help with muscle atrophy? Absolutely, yes. So if you're looking to decrease muscle atrophy, you need to think about the programs that you're gonna kind of be using NMES for. And if a muscle is shrinking, which is atrophy, you want to use the NMES regularly for decent bouts to actually increase the muscle bulk of the area. So it's not something that if I threw NMES on my bicep once a week, you know, for three sets of 10 repetitions, and that's not going to do anything to the atrophy of my bicep. But if I incorporate it regularly into my daily routine, and I'm starting to use it on a more regular basis, I can start to see a decrease in atrophy. And then eventually I can start to see hypertrophy, which is the building of the muscle if it's used regularly. FES, functional electrical stimulation, does a much quicker and faster job of kind of switching from atrophy to hypertrophy because you're getting 
a lot more contractions in a functional movement, but you can achieve some muscle bulking or growing with the use of NMES. How many years post injury or post inactivity can a muscle so muscle atrophy be reversed? Maybe muscle not atrophy time. can can always be reversed in terms of how far out you are from injury. But what you have to think about is the longer you are out from injury, generally the more atrophy you've had. So it would take a lot longer of a time frame and maybe a lot more stimulation sessions before you're going to see any change in that muscle, right? So in our rehab program, you know, we see our patients right away after injury. And if we can start stimming their muscles right away, we can prevent that atrophy from happening and we can keep that muscle bulk greater, right? If you're 10, 20 years post-injury and that muscle has significantly atrophied and shrunk, you know, it's going to take a lot more time and effort to start to kind of rebuild it back. But there's research that shows that, you know, if you put that time and effort into it, you can build it back. Are you going to build it back to its baseline function of, you know, how big it was before the injury? Probably not. But are you going to increase it from where it is now? Yes. And there's some significant benefits of that. So. Great. Okay, next question. Any device suggestion to target paralysis in hands or fingers? Yeah, so I'm, I wouldn't say, you know, a very specific device, but NMES, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, if you're looking at targeting paralysis and weakness, you would want to look at an NMES device. So hands and fingers gets a little bit hard because those muscles, they're very small muscles. So in terms of finding electrodes, and really targeting a very specific muscle becomes challenging because the muscle bellies are so small in those muscles, especially if they've atrophied. But working through kind of the forearm and putting electrodes here at the wrist to work on wrist flexion and finger flexion or bringing them back and working on extension here, that can absolutely help with some of the atrophy in the hand. You can't, what you can't do with the NMES is really target those fine motor movements like you would think about in terms of fine motor control. It's more the gross movements of the hand that you would be able to target with NMES, but you could absolutely do it. Okay, all right, next question. Uh, my daughter has an L2 spinal cord injury, Asia A. She has tried an RT bike before and loves it. While we're waiting for insurance approval uh, denied for first time for an FES unit, would you recommend a, an NMS, NMES unit? Uh, she has been diagnosed with significant osteoporosis and has had two fragility fractures. Yeah. So i sorry about the FES unit, but that is the total normal pattern of what they do. An NMES unit is not going to obviously provide what the FES unit provides. An NMES unit generally provides less power, less oomph. You are going to get much less muscle contraction, and you're usually going to get it only to one or two muscle groups. So you're not going to get the power of what you get from an FES device. But would it be good to use the NMES device right now? Absolutely. At least you're still getting some contraction through those muscles you are getting kind of that motor component. In terms of working with osteoporosis and kind of bone strengthening and preventing that bone weakening, NMES use isn't going to do that as much. You need the constant kind of functional movement with the electrical stimulation to really target more of the osteoporotic events that are happening in the muscle or in the bone, sorry, which is what the functional electrical stimulation units do. Um, but in terms of using the NMES, you can again prevent kind of that slow atrophy that's going to happen in the muscles. And if she is eventually going to use the FES bike, you could maybe build up some of the strength and endurance in certain muscle groups so that those muscles are a little more ready when she does get the FES bike. Uh, you made a comment about the placement of electrodes. Uh, did you say one inch apart or so two, two? Usually two finger widths apart is what we want so that you're not getting kind of the cross talk between the two electrodes. In some of the smaller muscle bellies, that becomes really hard, especially like we're talking about on the wrist and the forearm. So you definitely never want the electrodes touching and you do want them as far apart as possible in terms of um, the muscle belly itself. But sometimes it does become challenging two finger widths apart based on the size of the muscle that you're contracting. 
Um, one person is asking about the effects of applying a TENS unit directly to the site of the injury or at so, the site of the injury. Yeah, so that, I mean, that comes up a lot on, in terms of people questioning stuff. There's no research that's gonna show you that applying a superficial TENS unit to your T12 area that's going to help the stimulation of the spinal cord or nerve regeneration or improvement in the injury. In terms of TENS unit directly at the injury site, it could be for pain management, right? So in terms of neuropathic pain, a lot of people get that band-like neuropathic pain around their level of injury. So using a TENS unit for that would be appropriate as long as your if you had surgery, as long as the surgical incisions are healed, the skin is good. You know, if you're getting that neuropathic band-like pain around your T12, because that's where your injury level is, then it's very appropriate to apply the TENS unit there. It's not going to stimulate the motor component, right, and cause any spinal cord regeneration or recovery. Okay. Um, the same person is asking if uh, upon receiving a, an, an NMES unit, if it be recommended that uh, they get training from the doctor or the therapist. It's a really good question. So, you know, some of the devices are way more confusing than others. And some people, you know, understand technology a little bit better than others. So if you get the unit and you open it up and you look at my presentation in terms of talking about frequencies and pulse width and on off time, and you're like, holy cow, this is way too much. I have no idea how to use this. I highly recommend talking to your, a, therap a physical therapist about it. Doctors know a little bit, but they're more the ones who, you know, prescribe it and recommend it than actually physically use it. Um, physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors tend to have a lot more knowledge in kind of the electrical stimulation world than just a general practitioner would. Um, but if you are seeing a, a physical therapist, I would recommend that they kind of be your first line to go to in terms of questioning how to use it properly and things like that. Okay. Um, this next question is from the same gentleman that asked about the ENSO unit, uh, mm -hmm. and he's again asking about recommendations for pain control. I know you mentioned that you're not familiar with that particular ENSO uh, brand, but what are your recommendations for pain management? Yeah, so pain management, again, a TENS unit is what you're absolutely looking for. You're looking for that superficial stimulation to the sensory nerve. Um, you're not looking for super high intensities because you're not looking at, to achieve any muscle contraction. You're more looking for a constant slow stimulation to the sensory nerves to allow to kind of desensitize those nerves or again, kind of increase the endorphin um, application to kind of turn off the pain signal to the brain. So in terms of using you know, a TENS unit for pain management, you're looking at kind of either using, again, one of those pre-programmed therapies that I talked about to kind of mellow out that pain cycle that you're experiencing, or you can mess around with kind of some of those factors that we discussed in terms of the frequency and the pulse within the intensity to see what kind of helps. And there are plenty of like pre-set out templates in terms of how to help with pain. I'm gonna be really honest with you though, a lot of it is very person specific. So what works for one person's pain management is not going to be exactly what works for somebody else's pain management. In the next session, I'm gonna give some basic protocols in terms of using TENS unit for pain management and hypersensitivity. But again, they're gonna be basic protocols and it's not gonna be what's perfect for everybody. So knowing how to manipulate those settings to get what you want is really beneficial. And again, if you have access to a physical therapist or somebody who has, you know, a really good strong knowledge on electrical stimulation, they can really help you kind of, you know, manipulate those settings on your device to get exactly what you want out of it. Okay. Next question. Um, can NMES units be used continuously for hours at a time? So if you're using an NMES unit for, the, uh, for muscle stimulation and muscle contraction, I do not recommend using it for any extended period of time on a constant contraction setting, right? That would be me like walking around the house doing like 
500 bicep curls or like holding a 20 pound weight in my arm for like five or six hours a day, right? My bicep is not going to be happy after that. So in terms of using an NMES unit for a muscle contraction, you want to use it more in terms of like repetitions, like you would at the gym to strengthen a specific muscle, right? So maybe three sets of 15 a day, three sets of 20. If you want to do it twice a day, you can, but you don't want a constant contraction. The area that you use electrical stimulation for constant is more that TENS that we're talking about for pain management because it's not a motor contraction. So it's not gonna fatigue out the muscle. What the TENS is doing again is just sending a contraction to the sensory nerve to kind of turn off the sensory pattern. So it's okay to use TENS for you know 30 to 60 minutes at a time. But if you're using NMES for that amount of time, your body is not gonna be happy with you the next day. How would you best be able, especially when you don't have sensation, yeah. best be able to tell if you have atrophy or if you have fatigued your muscle or you have underworked the muscle? That's a good question. So in terms of if you can't feel the muscle contracting, looking at it is one way that you can do it, right? So if I have stimulation pads on my wrist here and I'm working on wrist extension with my wrist coming up, if I'm providing a constant, if I'm providing, let's just pick a random number, like 30 milliamps of power to my wrist and I'm doing sets of 10 and the first five, my wrist is coming up like this, right? And then on the last five, my wrist is coming like this. Well, I know that that muscle is fatiguing, right? So I can't necessarily feel the fatigue, but I can visually see that what used to be happening is this, and now what's happening is this. So you can use that kind of visual feedback to determine fatigue. The other thing that you can see is sometimes you'll just, when you put the electrodes on, you'll see the actual muscle bulk contract and tighten, right? And no matter whether the arm is moving or not, if you start to look down and that stimulation is being applied to those muscles still, and you don't see any of that tightening or contracting, you know that the muscle is worn out and tired and it's not necessarily beneficial to continue to stimulate it because it's, it's exhausted, right? So you wanna give it a break. Okay. Are there any wearable FES units for tricep function? So FES units, um, the functional electrical stimulation devices, they, they're not wearable, the arm bikes. So there's two different companies that create an FES arm bike they allow stimulation to the tricep. So they're both cycling devices. You can go forward and backwards and you can stimulate the triceps. Um, in terms of looking to just stimulate your tricep and strengthen it, you can use an NMES device if you wanted to um, and put the pads on your tricep here. And you can use kind of the NMES in relation with active activities, right? So functional electrical stimulation, the FES, it's more of a full body movement. Whereas NMES, you're looking at maybe more, you know, the tricep is an elbow extender, right? So if I bring my arm up on the table and maybe I can start to get a contraction, but I can't fully extend my elbow, if I apply NMES to my tricep and then work through repetitions of that, I can start to strengthen that muscle, what we would call functionally, but it's with an NMES unit, not an FES unit. So. NMES, can, you can use it during movements of your body. You're just not going to get the full contractions of other muscles like you would the FES unit. So to clarify on that point, would you, are you advocating that the exercise accompany the, any type of stimulation? That's Yeah. So for TENS, not necessarily, right? So for, if I'm looking at a sensory contraction, moving my body while I'm getting that isn't going to make a difference. But in terms of using an NMES device for muscle stimulation, absolutely. So if my goal is to increase my hand function and I'm just slapping, you know, stim pads here and just letting the stim work, well, if I actively try to contract with it and do a functional task, like grabbing a ball or moving my wrist, I'm going to get more out of it than if I'm just letting the stim do it. So absolutely using the stim along with any actual muscle strength that you have physically in your body is going to make the benefit even greater. 
quick clarification, uh, NMES can help with bone density or not? So in the research shows that NMES isn't going to do a significant, it's not going to alter your bone density significantly. To actually increase the bone density and pre prevent kind of that osteoporotic process from happening, you really need the high repetition of muscle contraction. So in order to increase bone density, you need the muscle to regularly pull strongly on the bone and that's what increases the bone density. So if I'm doing, you know, 30 repetitions of elbow extension, I'm not necessarily going to increase the bone density of my arm bone, right? But if I'm on an FES cycle for 45 minutes every day and I'm cycling and I'm getting those muscles contracting thousands and thousands of times within that session, that's what the research is showing is actually improving long-term bone density and decreasing osteoporosis. So there's no significant research in terms of just basic NMES doing it, where the research lies in osteoporosis is really more the FES world. Okay. Um, someone made a comment about asking about the effects of baclofen and uh, electrical stimulation together. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so a lot of patients and clients use both of both together, baclofen and electrical stimulation. There's no contraindication to using electrical stimulation if you're on baclofen. And what a lot of people have found is that with regular use, electrical stimulation can help to decrease muscle spasticity. So some people have been able to decrease their use of baclofen. I will again state kind of like just what we talked about with the osteoporosis is that spasticity management is best managed in terms using electrical stimulation with a functional and FES unit because you get again so many contractions per 30 minute session and you're fatiguing out that kind of like spasticity um, um, threshold kind of that you have. So with NMES again you may not see the huge effects on spasticity, um, especially over a long period of time. Um, but with FES, you can see a dramatic change in spasticity. So it may change the way that you're using your medication to manage your spasticity also. Next, uh, last question. Are you familiar with uh, a company called Axiobionics that uh, develops a wearable therapy with muscle sim sim stimulators? I believe they're the ones that are trying to incorporate electrical stimulation into a robotic like ambulatory device. There's a few units, they're not F they aren't FDA approved yet, but I think they are one of them that's doing that. And if I'm speaking wrong, I'm sorry, but I think it's them. Um, a lot of companies that have the robotic devices um, like Indigo, Exoskeleton, um, there's another one called Rewalk that's on the market. They are all looking right now at how they can, can incorporate the electrical stimulation component into these wearable robotic devices. The issue with robotic devices is that they move you, you put me in a robotic arm and it moves my arm, but if I'm not getting any active muscle stimulation and muscle activation, then all that robot is doing is it's moving my arm. It's not necessarily doing anything for the muscles, the bone density, stuff like that. So now all these robotic companies are kind of jumping on board and trying to kind of manipulate in electrical stimulation so that you can get more bang for your buck when you're in these robotic devices in terms of getting the ability to function, but also get the ability to maybe use some of those muscles there and get the contractions. So it's something that we're seeing. Um, there's, as far as I'm concerned or aware, there's nothing FDA approved yet, but I do know that a few of the companies are working on kind of merging the two concepts. Okay, sorry, I lied. One last question. Yeah. Is there a safe uh, electrode location um, for work on the chest muscles on an FES bike? Yeah, it's a good question. So most um, FES bikes do not come with a chest um, placement because it's very close to the heart and you do have to be careful with 
sending electrical impulses directly to another electrical impulse, which is your heart. So very few companies would recommend, and I would also not recommend, putting stim directly over the chest wall. You also have to be very, very careful over the front of your neck, because that's where all of those vessels kind of come and come up to your brain. So if you think about kind of a no zone in terms of stimulation, if you think about kind of like here, it's not a good area to kind of put stimulation. If you're looking at, you know, decreasing spasticity or something in the pec, sometimes you can kind of stimulate more at the armpit area, which is further away from the heart, which is where the pec, the chest muscles kind of go into. But I wouldn't recommend just slapping electrodes straight over your chest wall. Um, a lot of uh, individuals with SCI uh, experience shoulder uh, pain. Yeah. So where, uh, how close, I mean, you mentioned that you don't want to get it too close to the, to the head area, yeah. but how close can you get away with uh, by using the or placement of the pads? Yeah, so shoulders, you're usually pretty good in terms of your shoulder. You know, a lot of the shoulder pain is across the deltoid. A lot of people get it kind of up in their upper trap area back behind their shoulder blade. Those are all totally okay areas. You just don't want to slap. Like if you think about, you know, pulling kind of at these muscles on the front of your neck here, you don't want to slap them here. But the back of your neck in between your shoulder blades on the shoulder itself, totally okay and safe areas to go. Just stay away from that front of your neck. Okay. Yeah, Very but good. it's used significantly on shoulders for pain for sure. Um, I think it goes without saying that anyone that is uh, looking into using FES, NMES, or, or, or TENS, uh, just consult your, your doctors, your physicians to make sure that uh, that is safe for you to, to do so. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. um, again, everyone, um, this presentation was made possible by the grant from the Reeve Foundation. As I mentioned, uh, we are recording this and we'll send you the full video on Monday along with some uh, other information that uh, you would be interested in. So thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everyone else. Have a great rest of the weekend, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye right. now. Bye.